Welcome back to part five of this series of ISO 20022. In this session, we are going to understand the payment chain of a PAX 008 message. What are going to learn today? First, let's revisit key concepts because it has been since some time since we had the last four uh, videos. We will understand the payment flows of a PAX008 message and we would try to compare it with an empty message to which we are more familiar with. And finally, we are going to look at the message structure. So on revisiting key concepts, so since we are moving from MT to MX, we would have to unlearn and learn a few critical terminologies. So the first one is that of a field. In MT, we used to call tags as fields, but here we are going to call them elements of an XML tag. So for example, a 50K field in an empty message would now translate to a specific tag or an element in the XML format of an ISO message. Similarly, for every field, we used to have a format. For example, we used to have an address field for, for example, a 50 or a 52, where it used to have a big and then the next four lines for address. However, in the realm of XML, we are going to have a data type to suggest whether it's a numeric or an alpha or a character. Thirdly, we use to categorize the fields as either mandatory or optional. So we used to have it as M or O. And we now know that in an XML, these are established by the XSDs, which say that whether it is min occurrence or a man max occurrence. The parties in a message the probably the most important change or the concept or the term which you would have to remember is that we no longer use the word bank or a financial institution. It's going to be agent going on. So whether it is a sender or a receiver, it is nothing but a sending agent or a receiving agent. Then we have the ordering customer which used to be there in field 50 if you recollect. The ordering customer is now known as a debtor and a beneficiary customer of field 59 would now be known as a creditor. So this is one of the key differences when you come to the parties. The network validated rule is something which we have heard often. Now it's replaced by the concept called cross element complex rule. So what are the rules which actually govern the networks? And finally, the sender and the receiver, the field one and field two. And as we said that we always use the word agent in place of a bank. So it's becoming an instructing agent because they are the one who are instructing and sending the message. And finally, the receiver is the instructed agent because they are going to be instructed. Finally, uh, let's uh, uh, see the message structure again. Uh, we know that the first four alpha are the business areas. Next three characters is for the message identifier. Then the next three numeric is for the variant. And then the final two is for the version. So far in case of a PAX, it translates to PAX being the business area, which is payments, clearing and settlement. 008 is for the FI to FI customer credit transfer. And 001 is the variant and 08 is the version which keeps on changing. So in an MT103, we know that a typical flow is that an MT103 serial message transfers from one institute to another institute. So we have the ordering customer going on to an ordering institute, an intermediary institution, intermediary institution, the famous AWI or field 57, and then finally the beneficiary. To a PAX message, you will have a serial PAX message this time instead of an empty. And as we know that we have a debtor 
and a creditor. This is going to be the debtor's agent. We now no longer call it as bank. And then we have the creditor's agent. This is the creditor. This is the data. It's like sender's bank will now become debtor's agent. The receiver will become the receiver bank, which is the creditor agent. And now we have the intermediary bank. We no longer call it as bank. Remember, we call it as the intermediary agent one, intermediary agent two. So that's the key difference from an empty message. Now let's look deeper into uh, the parties. Now we are all familiar with the sender and the receiver. This is the sender and the receiver, which is now replaced by the instructing agent and the instructed agent as we saw it. Then on the leftmost side we have the debtor, the rightmost side is the creditor. So far so good. We have seen whatever we had uh, seen in the previous slides. Now what is new is something known as the ultimate debtor and the ultimate creditor. So these are new placeholders which have been uh, kept in mind because your debtor may not be the ultimate debtor or you might have an ultimate creditor. The creditor here may not be the ultimate receiver of the funds. It could be somebody else. So that's why there is a placeholder for ultimate debtor and ultimate creditor. Obviously these are not mandatory and the moment uh, you could have a situation where the ultimate debtor and the debtor are the same or the ultimate creditor and the creditor are the same. Similarly, a new one has come here is known as the initiating party. So this is another new one. So in, in all we have three new ones, ultimate creditor, uh, initiating party and the ultimate debtor. So initiating party is somebody who initiates it on behalf of the debtor. Because remember, it is not a must that a debtor always initiates a message. It could be another third party and hence a provision has been made for initiating party. Then we have the debtor agent. Then finally the sender receiver as usual. And then we have the parties in between. So now we will call it as the 53, 54, 55, 56 equivalent, which are now called as reimbursement agents. One, two, three and similarly an intermediary agent called one two and three so these are the parties which come in between the sender and the receiver before it finally reaches the receiver and then goes to a creditors agent which was earlier known as the awi so this gives a very good brief of the parties in the chain So how does the empty uh, structure looks like? We're all familiar. We have the, the header uh, and the application header block, the user header block, the finally the actual text where the message is there and then a trailer block for security. Similarly, on the right hand side, you have an MX message. If you look at the MX, it looks quite big because you have um, a, a, some envelopes known as the SwiftNet headers then a request and the request header. And uh, finally, we have the actual request payload. Now the actual request payload can be split into an application header and a document message. So it translates to here, the app header and the document. So the document is where the actual message content is placed. So it is synonymous, the text block is synonymous to your document placeholder and finally a trailer block could be similar to your crypto that's all we have in this session and hope this was a, a good session to understand the the payment flow and the parties uh, which are there in the pack 008 message the next session is going to be the um, interesting one where we highlight how charges are transmitted in the packs message thank you